Well, good morning, everyone. You're very welcome this morning to Balamina Baptist. A big welcome to you. If this is your first time with us, you're very welcome to uh, be here this Sunday morning and sing with us and hear the God's Word proclaimed. Alternatively, if this is your 500th time with us, you're equally welcome to be here uh, this morning. Just a reminder, uh, maybe over summer, you don't get really much of a chance to uh, fellowship with each other, with people being away on holidays. Just a reminder that coffee starts just after 10 on a Sunday morning. So if you want to come to the church a little bit early, grab a cup of coffee and grab a chat with somebody you haven't seen over the summer break, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. Some announcements for us this morning. Uh, we've got our summer prayer diary. I hope you've been praying along with that. Some copies are out in the mall. Quite extraordinary this week. We have 19 of our young people away either leading on a camp or being at a camp. So please be praying for those Christian young people. Be praying for those Christian leaders uh, as they head off and camp and as they hear God's word and as they serve God uh, in that way. Pray for especially for Katie M- Makaki, who's in uh, either in or very close to getting into Peru at the minute, uh, and the Baptist mission team out with her, and for Will, Rebecca, and Rebecca as they head to South Africa on uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, just one more announcement, which is the Holiday Bible Club and the Football Fun Week. They're happening on the 14th to the 18th, so two weeks away. We have roughly uh, 70 kids signed up for the Holiday Bible Club and 80 kids signed up for the Football Fun Week. We're going to close registration soon so we can kind of uh, get kids ready to be registered. So if you haven't signed up for that yet or there's somebody you want to invite who hasn't been invited, uh, make sure you let them know. We'll close registration later this week. Uh, And for Holiday Bible Club uh, volunteers, there's going to be a quick meeting after communion this morning just in the minor hall. It won't take uh, too long. So if you put your name down to help, uh, just join us in the minor hall for a few minutes uh, this morning. Uh, That's all uh, our announcements. If for other announcements, see our little announcement sheet uh, out in uh, the mall. Uh, Let's center ourselves. Let's gather ourselves. Let's uh, just still ourselves before the Lord this morning. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, and I'm going to read just from Isaiah 6, one of my favorite uh, passages of Scripture, where Isaiah sees a vision of the Holy God, the Holy God that we're going to sing to. But let me just read Isaiah 6, verse 1 to 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to each other as said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's stand this morning and let's sing and praise our God who is holy, holy, holy. So stand. <coughs>
take a seat. As you probably will know if you've been with us for a while, we love to read the Psalms uh, in our morning service, and this morning we find ourselves in Psalm 87. So if you've got a Bible with you, flick to Psalm 87 uh, with me. This is a, a, a stranger psalm maybe this morning because it's written not about a person, uh, but about a city, about the city of Zion, about the city where God dwells. And the point of this psalm is to say how great is the place where God dwells, how awesome is the place where God inhabits, where God meets with His people. But not only does this psalm praise God as the one who meets with His people, but he, it praises God as the God who saves people. The God is not just a God of Jerusalem, not just a God of the people of Israel, but as we'll read this psalm, we'll mention some other places, some other places that aren't in Jerusalem, aren't in Israel, that are elsewhere around the world, because this psalm praises God because He's not just the Savior of Jerusalem or of the Jewish people, but He's the Savior of the whole world. He's the Savior who saves people like us, People who aren't included anywhere in the Old Testament aren't there in the city of Jerusalem. The psalm looks forward to the day when God will not only be the God who dwells with His people in the city of Jerusalem, in the city of Zion, but looks forward to the day when God will dwell in people's hearts all around the world, even in Balamina this morning. Let's read this psalm. Psalm 87. A psalm of the sons of Korah. A song. On the holy mountain stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say, and of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High Himself will establish her. The Lord records as He registers the peoples, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. Let's praise our God who establishes His relationship and His presence with his people. Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you, God, for this song. We thank you that people through thousands of years of history have been singing these songs of praise to you, God, and you do not change and you have not changed. And what was sung about you then, what was written about you then is still true of you today. We thank you, Lord, this morning that you are an unchanging God that there is no shifting within you, that you're not like this one day and something else the next, God, that we can fully trust in you because you're the rock that does not shift and the God who does not change. And we thank you, Lord, for what we've read this morning. We thank you, God, that you love sinful people, people, God, who were rebellious against you, God, that you established your presence with them. You made a way, God, for people to dwell in the presence of God in the city of Jerusalem. And Lord, you have made a way for your presence to dwell with us this morning through the death and sacrifice of your Son, the Lord Jesus. We praise Him this morning as the God who died in our place, the God who took the punishment that we deserve. Also, God, that we it can be said of us that we were born in your presence. We were born in that holy city and in that place, God. Whenever we get there, whenever we reach the end of our lives, Father, we thank you. That is the place that we will dwell in your presence for all eternity. We thank you, God, for that eternity. We thank you, God, for that goal that we know that is ours, God, that whatever is going on in our lives this morning, whatever uh, turmoil we face, whatever challenges, God, there are, we thank you, God, that we can look up, that we can look into the future, and we can say, because of Jesus Christ, we will stand in your presence for all eternity, and not one person, not one thing can ever change 
or move that from us. And we praise you tonight. And we pray, God, for those people this morning, God, who need you, those people, God, this morning, who are hurting, the people this morning, God, that we know who are ill or in hospital or bereaved or have went through surgery, God, and we lift them up to you. And we pray, God, that you would be with them, that they would know that you dwell in them, God, that your Holy Spirit is with them. And Lord, that they can look up and look forward and know that one day that whatever challenges they may face, whatever turmoil they're going through this morning, that they will stand in your presence forever. We pray that too, God, for our young people on camp. We pray, God, for our leaders, God, as, as they preach your word, as they share your word, as they embody your word with young people, that they would share that great hope that they will stand in your presence. We pray that, God, for people abroad in South Africa, in Peru, all around the world, we pray for missionaries this morning, God, as they hold up and reach out the truth that God wants sinners to dwell with him, God, that you would bless them. And we pray for ourselves this morning, God, we just thank you for this place. We thank you for everybody here. We thank you, God, that you have gathered us here this morning, one by one that you have brought us here, that it's not a mistake that any of us are here this morning. And we pray, God, that as you would speak to us, as your word is open, as Stephen preaches, we pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to believe. And we pray all of this in your wonderful, majestic, lovely name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the band. We're going to continue uh, in worship. Uh, but just uh, to say that there are a uh, crash and a baby room. Uh, there's kids club for kids over three. And then for children in P1 to P4, there's some children's activities for them up in the youth lounge. So if you have children with you this morning uh, and you don't know where they should go, I'll be out in the foyer if you need any directions. But over to David and to the band to lead us. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, and uh, just as we sing uh, this first piece, uh, we'll remain seated and the deacons um, will wait on you for your offering, um, if that's okay. Um, and as also, I think it would be good if we just turned around and shook hands with everybody behind you and said, very welcome, lovely to see you, thank you for coming, so don't be shy, let's just do it. And uh... Okay, um, Jesus is the righteousness of God revealed to us, and uh, in this first piece, we're just going to sing those words, and the chorus is that his kingdom will know no end, and his glory will know no bounds. What fantastic words of comfort, of, of uh, praise this morning. So let's just remain seated as we sing this song. Thank you.
just penetrate our hearts this morning I will build my life upon your love because it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken father we thank you this morning that we can build our lives on you the solid rock the one who doesn't change and we just pray that as we listen to your word now father that you will take it and use it mightily in each of our lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, my thanks to Josh, our youth pastor, for opening our service, and uh, to David and the team for leading us. Uh, in worship. If you have your Bibles, please, would you turn to Matthew chapter 6? Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, special welcome to Pastor Alfie and Mrs. El Elsie Orr, all, visiting all the way from Australia, just can't, from New Zealand, sorry. 
there they are. It's lovely to have them with us. Alfie was the pastor in Crumlin and then the pastor in Gort Murren uh, before that, so it's good to have them uh, with us today. So Matthew uh, chapter uh, 6, um, when Jack Nichol, uh, Nicholson was uh, one of the greatest golfers in the world every year, he would, uh, before the season started, he would turn to his coach, Jack Grout, and he would say, uh, Jack, teach me how to play golf. And Jack uh, Grout would uh, strip him back to the essentials of the game of golf uh, for the start of the season. In Luke 11, the disciples come to Jesus, and in verse 1, they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And in response to that, Uh, Jesus gives them almost a verbatim copy of what we have here in Matthew 6. So, what we have here is a a teaching device uh, helping us to order and uh, structure our prayers and how much we need that then because prayer is one of those disciplines that we find uh, so difficult. So, we began last week. We're picking it up uh, this week. Let's read from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard. For their many words, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, Your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Amen. And we know God will always bless the reading of His own inspired Word. So we uh, began last week to look uh, at what has become known as the Lord's Prayer, but probably more accurately uh, should be referred to as the Believer's Prayer or the Disciple's Prayer, because our Lord here is giving us instruction uh, on how we should pray and how we should approach God in prayer. He has already warned us against the hypocritical praying of the Pharisees who put on a performance before men and the mechanical praying of the pagans or the Gentiles who through the, their endless repetition of words think that they will remove, uh, move a reluctant deity to act on their behalf. Do not be like them, says Jesus, verse 5 and verse 8. This then is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our, for, our, our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, we looked at the first line of uh, the Lord's Prayer last week, which in essence is an a introduction to the other petitions, our Father in heaven. Before you start, says Jesus, stop, pause, and remember who God is. Before you even pray, remember that He is the great God of heaven. He is your heavenly Father, and you must approach Him corporately. That prayer is corporate. It's our Father who is in heaven. It's intimate. He is our Father, that by grace and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into His family by the legal act of, uh, of adoption. We are His children. So, prayer is corporate, it's intimate, it's reverent, because although He is our Father, He's still the great God of heaven. Our God, says the writer to the Hebrews, is a consuming fire. Not was, but is. And those who approach Him must approach Him with reverence and with all that he, he is the great God of heaven. 
And in that introduction, you have those two terms uh, that uh, theologians use to describe uh, God, His imminence, that He is our Father, and His transcendence, that He is our Father who is in heaven. So we pray corporately, intimately, reverently, and then confidently because He is the great God uh, of heaven, that He's seated on a throne, that He is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, that we can approach His throne of grace with confidence, know that, knowing that, that we come to a God who uh, we are intimately related to and we can call, dare to call our Father who is in heaven. That is the God to whom I come. Now, after that pause in His presence, the first words that come from our lips ought to be words of adoration and praise. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Now, I want to look at this petition in three ways, the meaning of the petition, the priority of the petition, and the object of the petition. So, first of all, the meaning of the petition. What does our Lord actually mean when He tells us that we should begin our praying by hallowing the name of God. Well, let's look at the two key words in the phrase, uh, name and hallow. First of all, name. To hallow the name of God does not mean that we treat the letters that comprise that name uh, with respect, that the title that we apply to God that we simply treat with respect. That if this name was written down, we would treat the paper with special regard, that we would be careful how we would use His name in our speech. That's how the scribes and the Pharisees uh, treated the Old Testament name Yahweh, formerly uh, referred to as uh, Jehovah. If you were copying out a scroll in the ancient world and you came across this name Yahweh, you wouldn't even write it. You would substitute something else in for fear of taking the, His name in vain. So, uh, they would write simply the name or the name that I dare not mention or, as Paul picks up in Philippians uh, 2, the name that is above every name. They, they wouldn't write that name down. Now, that's not what Jesus means here. The name meant more than the title that was used. In Semitic thought, the, the, the name was closely associated with a person's character. Indeed, when a person's character changed, their name changed. So, you have that um, impetuous, rough, uh, explosive man, Peter, who, who uh, was uh, so unstable, and yet under grace and by God, he was going to become a rock, and God changes his name from, uh, uh, from Simon to uh, Peter, to Cephas uh, in Aramaic. Uh, so, if we were to speak about Stephen Curry, you would speak about all his faults and failings, his shortcomings, his flaws and maybe one or two virtues too. All that he is would be bound up in his name. And the same is true of God. You see that wonderfully illustrated in Exodus 33. And I want you just to turn back to Exodus 33 and into Exodus 34. Um, Exodus 33 and verse, let's read from verse 17. Exodus 33, verse 17. Exodus 33, 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Do you see that? I know you by name. He didn't know that his name was Moses. He knew him intimately and personally. He knew all about him. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now then go down to uh, chapter 34 and uh, verse 4. So 
34, verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will in no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to word the earth and worship. So here's Moses in this cleft of a rock, and God comes and, uh, and proclaims his name, reveals his glory, and his name is in revealed in his attributes that he's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and just punishing the children to the third and fourth generation. That the, the name, the revelation of his name revealed his character. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 20 and verse 1, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. The name of God isn't some kind of lucky charm that you can carry around and and uh, speak in a, uh, in a time of distress, and somehow magically and mystically that protects you. It's all that God is, that all God has revealed about Himself, His character that protects you. And so, in the New Testament, Peter says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't mean if you call Jesus, Jesus, Jesus often enough that you're saved, but that you, you call on His name, on all that He is on his deity, on his humanity, on his um, passive obedience where he kept the law perfectly, and his active obedience where he went to the cross and spilt his blood on Calvary's cross in order to purchase the redemption of a great multitude that no man can number, that you call on all that he is to experience the salvation of God. That's why the third commandment cannot be restricted to some verbal curse word. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It it's means that uh, you, you must treat God and all that's revealed about God with the utmost respect. When we were at college, our systematic theology lecture retired and a replacement was brought in, and instead of dealing with the big issues, the thorny issues, he, he simply took the names of God, and we were so disappointed until he started to explain the names of God. Elohim, that first revelation of the name of God in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God, in the plural form, in the plural form, in the Old Testament that God is, is more than one person, that He's three in one, El Shaddai, that He is the all-powerful, sovereign God, the, the, the mighty one, or those compound names that we're so familiar with, like uh, Jehovah Jireh, or Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace, Ruah, the, the Lord our shepherd, or Jehovah Sekenu, the Lord our righteousness. You see, God revealed Himself, His character and His nature. He revealed His name. You know, in the proper Lord's Prayer, where our Lord is actually praying uh, to His Father in John 17, He says, I have revealed you, uh, uh, revealed your name to those whom you have given me out of the the world. So, Jesus isn't saying, you know, I, you know I, I told the disciples that special name, that exclusive name that's only their property. No, all that God was and is, the Father was and is, He, he revealed uh, uh, the Father to the disciples so uh, He could say to the disciples, He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
That's what the name represents. It's all that God is. And to hallow the name of God means that you have in front of you and in the forefront of your mind the character of God. Now, let's look at the other word, hallow. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed is a, an old-fashioned English word which was retained by the translators of the modern versions because they couldn't think of a better translation. And uh, part of that is uh, it, it comes from the, the, the root of the word for holy, but we have no verb uh, for holy in the English language, so you can't say holify your name. You could use the other uh, word, which is sanctify, sanctify your name, which means to set apart, to treat as holy. That's what the hallowed mean. It, it means to, to holify, to sanctify to set apart the name of God as holy. Now, let's think of this for a moment. If God's name represents all that God is, is His name not holy? Of course it is. God is absolutely holy. We have sung about that this morning. He is holy in His essence, in His nature. So then, why pray, hallowed be your name, make your name holy, because God is holy. But you see, when we pray this first petition, I'm praying that God might be regarded as holy in my heart. He is holy, but that I would treat Him as holy, that He would be set apart as holy in my heart, that I would worship Him as holy that He will be more holy, not actually, but in my eyes. John Calvin says that God's name should be hallowed was nothing other than to say that God should have His own honor of which He is so worthy. So, this isn't so much a, a petition that God's name would be hallowed, but it's, it's it's a request. It's, 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 may I worship you, adore you, love you, treat you as holy. May you be hallowed in my heart as I approach you in prayer. May you be set aside as the supreme holy one in my heart. That true prayer begins with praise and worship. This is very important. If we are to structure our prayer in this way, that we must then begin by worshiping God. And to worship God, you must be acquainted with God. You must know God. You must um, be aware of His attributes, of who He is and what He is like. Do you remember that great statement in John 4 where Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The day is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Just before that, he says to her, you worship what you do not know. We, referring to the Jews, we worship what we know. That you cannot worship God acceptably and rightly unless you know who God is and you know what He's like. And that's why Bible reading is, is so important because as you read the Scriptures, you can read about His works in, providence, in creation, providence, and redemption. You can read about all His activity, and then that forms the basis of your adoration and worship. That's why theology is so important. People say, oh, I'm not interested in theology, but theology, theo is the Greek name for God. Theology is loving God with your mind. It's fueling the, the, the content of your prayers and your worship and your adoration of God. And if you are to hallow the name of God, you've got to know who God is. B.B. Warfield defined Reformed theology as a, a perfect appre apprehension of God and majesty. Well, that's what worship is, a perfect apprehension of God in majesty. He is and deserves, the, He is the holy God and deserves to be holified, to be hallowed, 
to be worshipped in the very depth uh, of our hearts, the meaning of the petition. The second thing I want you to notice is the priority of the petition. Now, remember that our Lord is teaching us to pray, <clears throat> and He's providing for us a skeleton by which we may order our prayers. And He says the very first thing you must do when you begin to, 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 to pray is to worship the name of God before you do anything else. Before you ask for anything else, before you pray about anything else, you worship God. Hallowing the name of God becomes before everything. Before you pray about your temporal needs, give us this day our daily bread. Before you pray about your spiritual needs, lead us not into temptation. Even before you pray about the salvation of your, your kith and kin, your friends and relatives, your colleagues at work, your kingdom come. Before all of that, you worship God. God's glory comes before our daily bread, the forgiveness of our sins, and even the salvation of souls. The compilers of the catechism had it perfectly right when they uh, said in response to the first question of the catechism, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, it seems to me that's a lesson that needs to be burnt into the heads and hearts of the Lord's people all over again. So often we hurry into His presence and we begin by maybe casting our cares upon Him, which is important, or asking that He would intervene in some trial or difficulty that we're going through, or maybe unselfishly pray for someone else who's going through hardship and, and difficulty, and we begin to pray those gimme prayers or those be with prayers, be with Him in this and be with Him in that. And Jesus says, stop. Stop all of that and just adore and worship the living God, the God who you're in an intimate relationship with. Now, how did you pray this morning? I hope you did pray before you came to church, but how did you start your prayers? Bless the band. Bless Stephen as he preaches. Help me to worship you. Or did you stop and just adore the living God. What do I say? Well, use, use the Bible to fuel your prayers. Look for uh, revelations of His character, of who He is and what He has done, and worship Him. Romans 11, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so you say to God, if, if I have to go without daily bread that your name would be glorified, let it be. If I, if I have to walk in the, the paths of temptation that your name would be glorified, let it be. If my prayers for the salvation of my children and those that I love are delayed in being answered, let it be that God's name above everything else might be glorified. Hallowed be your name. The meaning of the petition, the priority of the petition, and the subject of the petition. <clears throat> now, when you pray, hallowed be your name, what name is it that you're praying to? And you say, well, the name of God, and that's right, we worship the true and living God. But Scripture is a little bit more precise than that. When we pray, when we worship, it is to the Father that our prayers and worship ought to be directed. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Whose name? The Father's name, hallowed be your name. Now, don't misunderstand me at this point <clears throat> and Please listen to me carefully. I don't want anybody <coughs> going home this afternoon saying that Stephen Curry says that it's wrong to pray to the Son and it's wrong to worship Jesus. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there's a, a divinely revealed priority here and worship that constantly terminates upon the Son is not acceptable worship. I says, Jesus is God. 
There are times when it's perfectly appropriate to pray to Jesus and to focus our acts of worship upon Jesus and our prayers upon Jesus. Thomas, when he fell at the feet of Jesus, cried, my Lord and my God. He was rendering worship, and the Lord Jesus Christ accepted that worship. In Revelation 1, John fell at the feet of Jesus as though he was dead. He prostrated himself in worship. In Revelation 5, 9 to 12, we have recorded for us worship that's directly offered to the Son. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. In Acts 7, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. There are certain times that it's perfectly appropriate and acceptable to have the Lord Jesus Christ himself as the object of our prayer and praise. But worship that continually is focused upon the Son is unacceptable worship. The framework in Scripture is directed uh, that we come to the Father through the Son in the energy of the Spirit. If you just turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 for a moment. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Um, Let's read from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Ephesians 2, verse 15. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, that's Jew and Gentile coming together, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Do you see that? In him, we have access uh, through Christ to one Father. Here's the activity of the triune God and taking Jews and Gentiles and fusing them together into one worshiping community, that psalm that Josh read to us this morning that the, the house of the living God is going to contain people uh, both from uh, inside Israel and outside Israel. They're worshipped in, uh, uh, they're formed into one worshipping community. And, uh, and the object of their adoration and the, their worship is clearly the Father. Now you say, if Jesus is God, the Father is God, and the Spirit is God and there's no jealousy in the Godhead, why will we be careful about this? Because God has revealed a perspective in worship, an order in worship, and the Father is the, the, that perspective. Uh, just look at the prayers of Paul. If you still have your finger in Ephesians, look at Ephesians 3 and verse 14. Ephesians 3 and verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Do you see that? Before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that we come to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 4, that verse I've already quoted, Believe me, woman, the time is coming and has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, as I said last week, Sinclair Ferguson has this, this wonderful quote where he, he, he says, uh, you cannot open the pages of the New Testament without realizing that one of the things that makes it so new in every way is that men and women call God Father. Now, this is a, a, a distinctive uh, revelation of New Testament worship that we come and call him our Father. In fact, one uh, a scholar uh, traced uh, uh, Jewish prayers right through the Old Testament, right through their history, and there were little schools of rabbis that taught children and young people to pray. And there is not one recorded instant where they address God as Father right up until the 10th century. 
A.D. Not one record. This is a New Testament doctrine. God is described as Father in the Old Testament, but very rarely and usually prophetically. So, so we come to God and we address Him as our Father. This is a blood-bought New Testament uh, a privilege that it's through Him we come before His throne and we call Him our Father. And that is the perspective. And it seems to me that there's, there's a, a double problem in today's church, that children will always pray, Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this and we thank you for that. Our children used to pray like that. I think they picked it up in Sunday school, which probably reflects in my teaching. But, but um, they used to pray, uh, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus this, Dear Lord Jesus that. But it's a simple correction to make. It's just a, it's just a bad habit that your prayers are to be directed to the Father. So that's, that's one issue. But then I, I have noticed young people, and I don't want to be overly critical or harsh here, but young people, when they pray, they don't even use the term Father anymore. Do you notice that? They say, dear God, and it's God this and God that. Well, that Access to the Father has been purchased with the blood of God's own Son. It's by that Galatians 4.4. 4. It's, it's by that act of, of uh, redemption that we can come before His throne and cry, Abba, Father. Why would you not use the, the, the term that is given to us in the New Testament when it comes to formulating your prayers? And also, there's another little benefit, because it helps you be Trinitarian in your prayers. So you're coming to the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit. Now, I have lost count of times, and it's not just this church, it's so many churches, at the table where people thank the Father for dying on the cross. We thank you, Father, that you died upon the cross. Father didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Now, it, it, you know, I'm not accusing, I'm not attaching blame in that. It's just a bad habit. But if you remember that you're coming to the Father through the Son in the energy of the power of the Spirit, I, I, I do think that helps you. It certainly helped me and corrected some uh, bad habits, I think, that I've picked up uh, in my early Christian life. So, there we have it then. Uh, the meaning of the petition, it means to holify, to sanctify, to worship the Lord your God, to come before Him with adoration and, and praise. The priority of the petition, before you do anything else, before you run into His presence so casually, pause and remember who He is, our uh, Father who is in heaven, and then pour out your, your heart's devotion to Him. And even in that opening line, there is that response uh, in, the, in the first petition, hallowed be your name. I thank you, God, that you have made me your child, that you are my Father. You, you uh, worship His great name before you do anything else. Having trouble in, in uh, uh, spending 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour in prayer, start by worshiping His great name. And then the object of our petition, we come to the Father. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Don't, please don't fall into bad habits. Please don't let... Um, people uh, lead you astray as far as praying to Jesus or picking up at university, off this opposite university, that people address God, the Father as God, God. This. Use the name. Use the name that He has given to us and revealed to us. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we just thank You for this uh, uh, 
wonderful prayer. We thank you for this wonderful example of praying, and we pray, O oh God, that you would help us never, ever, ever to take you lightly or for granted, that you might be the, 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 the object of our adoration and praise, and that when it comes to prayer, that the first words of our lips might be might be worship, and that we would truly glorify you from the depths of our hearts. Forgive us for those times we pray selfishly and, uh, and uh, forget, like those nine lepers who left the Lord Jesus, forget to render worship to the one who has done so much for us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand <coughs> conclude this part of our service with Hymn of Heaven.
decir.